It's that time of the year where the pumpkins are displayed and Spirit Halloween takes up any vacant building they can. But of course, there's a darker side to the candy and costumes. Halloween is the spooky season, so what better way to celebrate than terrifying yourself with a dark and dreary video game? Today we'll be playing my personal favorite horror series, Penumbra. It's a two-part series, starting with Overture and ending with Black Plague. There is an additional title, Requiem, though it's quite disconnected from the other two games and serves as more of a puzzle game rather than a horror game. So let's jump right into the first title and get to the spooks. Penumbra is old, not DOSBox old, but old enough to where you won't want to tab out of the game once it's up. This means that the game is quick to download and install, but it also means that those textures are going to look a little fuzzy up close. That doesn't mean that the game looks bad as a whole, quite the contrary in fact. Penumbra houses some of the best lighting, especially considering this game was made over 17 years ago. Whether it be the dim bloom from your glow stick, or a nearby light bulb on its last hour, the lighting is what sells the experience. The impressive lighting works wonders, keeping the visuals looking good despite its age. But visuals are only the first part of the presentation, the second being audio. The game can look scary, but if it sounds like a muffled cacophony, you're not going to be sold, and as such, not immersed or invested. We, uh, don't have that issue here. China base. In the hooves of the ball. Penumbra sounds just as good as the lighting makes it look, and even though I've played through these games half a dozen times each, they still manage to capture a sense of dread and hopelessness each time I play. Whether it's the collection of a somber note that hints at larger forces at play, or frantically trying to open the door before you get eaten by whatever otherworldly creature caught your scent, Penumbra always delivers appropriate and memorable moments. The final part of Penumbra's technical finesse comes in its gameplay. It's a puzzle game first and foremost, though if you're brave enough, the first title also contains the hidden martial art of Hammer Fu, which can dispatch most hostiles with a bit of practice. Puzzles come in many forms, some of you have reading notes and turning machinery on, others have you concocting explosive chemical mixes to clear rubble, but most involve some sort of physics-based interaction, which completes Penumbra's immersive trinity. Many objects can be picked up, pushed, pulled, thrown, and otherwise moved in some fashion. It's a pretty simple idea, but you'll notice right away that not all items move with the same gusto. Heavier objects may not be as easily handled as smaller rocks and bottles. It's difficult to explain fully, but as soon as you click on an item and start moving it, you'll know a lot about it. Is it heavy? Is it lopsided? Does it roll? Can you stand on it? So many characteristics about any given item which play into how you can use them in solving puzzles. The visuals and lighting, the audio, and the physics have all become a staple of Frictional's games, and it's fun to see where it all started here with Penumbra. But the biggest thing that connects the two titles is, of course, its story. The first game, Overture, opens more questions than it can answer, and mostly serves to set things up for the next title, Black Plague, to run with. I suppose I'll preface this by giving a spoiler alert, if you haven't played these games within the 15 years they've been out and want to now, this is your warning. Overture's opening cinematic is brief, but it houses the main motivation behind both titles. We play as Philip, who receives a letter from his father, the letter basically says, here's a code to a lockbox at the bank. Destroy everything in it and don't look for me. Well, that sounds like an invitation to read everything in the lockbox and look for Philip's father, which is exactly what happens. Following the coordinates within the lockbox takes Philip to a remote location in Greenland. Like, really remote. The irony of the name Greenland strikes again, and so you escape the cold down a hatch to a mostly abandoned mine. 
and from there, the game has begun. Any cozy and safe feelings you had will be gone for the remainder of both titles. So we just dropped down the hatch, abandoned mine, pretty standard stuff. You're picking up stuff, you're moving stuff, you're breaking stuff, but eventually you'll run across your first note that hints that this mine might not be exactly normal. An article talking about how the miners have been acting strangely, how the uh, self-closure rate is astronomically higher than the national average. The article chalks it up to a chemical in the rocks, though local interviews talk about spirits living in the mountains, known as the Turngate. As further evidence says something that is very much wrong here, Philip runs across what sounds like a person behind a locked door. Exploring the area, you can find notes from this person, logging the events of their captivity. He's been down here for a while, and so to sustain himself, he's been eating spiders. These spiders have grown mutant-like in size, and after some time, he suspects along with the spiders, he's been ingesting a dangerous toxin they have, thus infecting and swelling his tongue. His tongue needs to be removed, and you can find the aftermath of this procedure in his room. Surprisingly, he survived the operation, but unfortunately not long enough for Philip to question him. There's smaller stories like this throughout the game, and each note you find is a fun discovery in itself, and each one comes with just a little more information for you to piece together what's happening and why. Once Philip makes it further into the mind, he finds a radio with, unbelievably, a person on the other side. This person is called Red, and he's your guide throughout the game. Well, as much of a guide as he can be, really, he's crazy. Like, really, really crazy but he's also one of the strongest parts of the story. He breaks up the silence, and his voice performance is very well done. I hope that your warped sense of morality is better company than I, because now it is all you have left. Um, I'm sorry. Sometimes my emotions are like a disobedient pet, uncontrollable and often rolling in shit. Better safe than sorry, they say, but I think we are both sorrier than we are safe. A tunnel lies between a nearby watery cave and the place where things are kept. Take the second right from the closed door, and you will find what you seek. There's not a lot of story moments in the game. You're mainly just going deeper into the mine. The goal remains the same. Find your father, Howard. The notes you pick up give you most of the background, but the game boils down to solving puzzles to go deeper. It's not a terrible way to push the game forward, but you can really see the roots of many ideas here. Some of which get expanded on, like the puzzles and the story. Other mechanics fade away, like equipable tools and combat. Overture does a lot of things really well, but it can still feel like the game is testing the waters with different mechanics rather than committing to some. The second game resolves most of these issues, but we're not there just yet. We still have to kill Red. Yes, unfortunately towards the end of your journey, the only friendly voice left in the mines pleads with you to kill him. There's no other option. He holds the key to progress, and you need to incinerate Red to get it. It's a sad moment. I mean, you don't want to kill him, but as you look through his belongings, you can find out that Red has been down here since he was 14. All that time, alone, with only Shakespeare to keep him company. He sort of owed death at that point. The secret society the game has been hinting at through its notes is no more prominent than when you step through this door leading to what's called the shelter. Philip chases a humanoid figure, only to be knocked unconscious and dragged away. Roll credits. Black Plague picks up right where Overture left off, with a quick and poetic recap to boot. You had to know how far I was willing to go. You had to know how desperate I was. You had to know how lonely I was. You had to know how guilty I felt. 
You had to know how stupid I was. All of these things. So human, so perfect. And yet still I fail to do what I must now ask of you. <gasps> Philip awakes locked in a room he was dragged into after getting cracked over the head. Immediately, you can feel the upgrades from the first game. Controls are a bit tighter, with stronger movement and better handling on items. The graphical fidelity is mostly the same, though there's a much better variation in the environments, and the lighting is even better than it was in the previous title. When everything comes together, the game can just look downright amazing. Not to mention the puzzles are far better. The puzzles in Overture aren't bad, but it was a lot of moving boxes to get on top of a shelf, or blocking off tunnels with rocks. Of course, those weren't the only puzzles, there were more complicated ones, but in Black Plague, more of the puzzles are more in-depth, which makes the game as a whole feel more streamlined. Less puzzles where the challenge is doing, and more puzzles where the challenge is thinking, which I personally prefer. So the gameplay is the same, just better. No combat at all though, you're completely defenseless this time. There are ways to defeat the enemies you run across, but it's not exactly intended or accounted for, so for all intents and purposes, there's no combat. But the biggest change is in the story. Not that the original plot was dropped or changed, but there's a lot more answers than new questions here, which can make the second game feel a lot more complete than the first. Towards the beginning of the game, there's a timeline of events which leads you up to the current moment. There's a lot, from the mine being open, to it being used as a bunker in World War II, to the most recent and impactful event, the opening of the Turngat tomb. Throughout the game, you'll learn that the Turngat aren't exactly aliens as much as they are an ancient entity. They're a hive mind which infects hosts. When they infect something, or someone, all their knowledge and memories are slowly shared between the two entities, and it's also theorized that the Turngate may also be able to section off the consciousness of a living person, effectively making them a prisoner in their own mind. Having such control over the host means that the Turngate can also prevent the host from dying by their own hand, which explains why Red wanted Philip to kill him. He was infected and simply couldn't do it himself. Needless to say, none of that sounds very fun. Moreover, within the first hour or so of the game, Philip becomes infected with a new Turngat voice in his head. This entity takes the name of Clarence, based off It's a Wonderful Life. I think I should have a name. Strange. So rare an opportunity to select one's own nomenclature. And yet, I find myself at a loss. 3,103 and a half pills, you see? You only got the first half of It's a Wonderful Life in here! Huh, how does it end? Now I'll never know! You know, Clarence, that's not a bad handle. I am something of a guardian angel. You also get into contact with a few other characters who, by this point, you can probably already guess the fate of. Hey, I think that's a piece of her skull on your shoe. The story of Penumbra is the best part. Sure, it's part scary monster chase, but it's also part Illuminati experiments gone wrong. There's a lot to learn about the secret society, the Turngat, and the various events and casualties of the mine. The secret society was founded by Leonardo da Vinci and later revealed to his pupil on his deathbed. They also don't technically have a name, though internally and unofficially it's called the Archaic. Very fitting. So after the stories of strange happenings in the mine make their way to the Archaic's ears, they decide to check it out, and start by building a research facility called the Shelter underneath the mine. This shelter is completely self-sufficient, which allows them to invade any outsider eyes. For a good 30 years, the shelter functions peacefully, slowly uncovering and studying these Turngat artifacts. That is, until they stumble upon the Tomb of the Turngat. The Archaic opens the tomb, thus releasing the spirit within, which is how all of this happened. The Turngat infects almost all the staff, thus converting them into those mindless zombies you've been running from. That's the cliff notes of the events leading up to the state of the shelter when Philip arrives. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, Philip also gets infected. Clarence is to Black Plague what Red was to Overture. He breaks up the silence, though unlike Red, Clarence's intentions are malicious through and through. Not only does Philip want him gone, but in the last moments of the game, the Turngat Hive also kills him, stating that he was too human, too individual for the Hive. 
After that, Philip communes with the Hive and has to pass a series of tests in order to progress. These tests house puzzles with a few solutions, though only the most selfless solutions will please the Hive. Shut it! Once you complete the tests, the turn gate then give you an exposition dump, pleading for Philip to simply let sleeping dogs lie so that the turn gate can be left alone. Philip then sits down to write an email as he slowly loses his mind. Instead of leaving the turn gate alone, Philip calls upon someone to... Well, I think he says it best. And that's where the game and series ends. It's a dark ending, but it's satisfying in its own way. It's a small twist that leaves you wondering if Philip made the right call. It's a story that leaves you thinking afterwards, which, to me, is the sign of a well-told story. As I mentioned at the beginning, there is a third title in the series, though it's supposedly a standalone expansion for Black Plague. It takes place in Philip's head during the last moments of Black Plague as he's going insane. It's only puzzles, and really, it's only for the puzzles. There's no interesting story, no monsters to run from, no resources to manage, it's just puzzles. I've played it a couple of times, and it's not bad, it's pretty fun, but it's just not really Penumbra. It doesn't add to the world or the story, it's just kind of there. There's also some community-made games for the Penumbra series, I haven't played those, but I probably should. It's nice to see this series holding on to its passionate and talented fanbase, because I'm definitely a part of it. The, the passionate side, not, not so much the talented side. I really like these games. They're fun little monster chase games, but they also take a turn towards the existential with some really well-written storytelling. That's the big one for Halloween. I probably should have played more for this month, but I was just barely able to get this video out in time, so maybe the other titles and frictionals lineup can be for the other spooky month of the year. November. Ooh, scary. Uh, okay, maybe not. But if you made it to the end of the video, thank you. It really does help the channel. If you want to see more of Frictional Games' lineup, I'd be happy to talk about them. They're all very, very fun. They make some of the best thriller games out there with some of the most interesting stories. If you've played Penumbra or are just hearing about it now, let me know down in the comments. Until next time.